uh, my name is Caroline, Caroline Seitz. I'm a junior. I am originally from Nashville, Tennessee. I am studying off campus this semester in Gill, Massachusetts. I'm a Spanish and an English major. Um, this is my eighth show with The Green Room, which is Amherst College student-run theater company. So thank you all so much for being here tonight and supporting us. Um, this is the second show I've directed in addition to Blue Fog Horizon um, by Sally Seitz last fall. Um, and yes, thank you so much for being here, for supporting The Green Room, um, for um, all the friends and family members of the cast. Thank you so much for sharing um, you're wonderful people with me over the last couple months. It's been an amazing experience. Um, the Antipodes uh, is a play at its heart about hope, about storytelling, um, as Sandy puts it, during these dark times. Um, and I think there's a lot about this play that resonates with us in our current moment. Um, but that's all I'll say about that. I'm extremely proud of the cast. I'm so thankful that you're all here, seeing a lot of familiar names. Um, without further ado, here is The Antipodes by Annie Baker. No dwarves or elves or trolls. Heinz? Griffin. Human head, Griffin body Lord. like a goat. Fawn. Werewolves, vampires. Obviously, we can't do werewolves or vampires. I'm just Griffin. Cannibals. Cannibals. Cannibals oh, monsters. Right. Uh, mm. Toys. Banshees. Are you putting this in the notes? Should I start taking notes? You should have started taking notes 20 minutes ago. What did we say already? Giants, centaurs. Wait, hold on. Uh, Cyclops, a uh, griffin, a uh, human head goat. Human head goat is a fawn. Okay. Uh, giants, centaurs, uh, cyclops. Trolls. Um, we're not doing dwarves or elves oh. or trolls. Right. Manticore. What? Is that a thing? Manticore? I familiar. don't think that's a thing. What's a manticore? Brian? Uh... Medusa. What was Medusa? She was a gorgon. Right. What's a, what's a gorgon? Manticore. Lion's body and a human head, three rows of teeth, eats people whole. Maybe I was thinking. I've never heard of that. A gorgon, a female monster. The name derives from the ancient Greek gorgos, which means awful creature. Any one of three sisters who had hair made out of living venomous snakes. Medusa was raped by Poseidon, so Athena got jealous and made her super ugly. A large gorgon eyes represented by spirals, concentric circles, swastikas, fire wheels, what and other images. What are you looking at? Swastikas? Uh, a number of historical scholars interpret the myth of Perseus and Medusa as a quasi-historical sublimated memory of an actual invasion. Hmm. What the? No to Gorgons. What else do we have? Well, I'm Icelandic. You're Icelandic? My dad is, but there's a bunch of like weird Icelandic monster stuff, but I don't know if that's interesting. Iceland. My That's sister cool. just got back from Iceland. Iceland's like super hip these days. She showed me this picture and it, it looked like a screensaver. Like there was a rainbow and a waterfall. Ooh. <laughs> oh, 11.30 already. And the, I thought we could start with Tonica. Great. Uh, has everyone met Sarah? You already know these idiots. <laughs> Hi, Hi, Sarah. Hi, guys. Uh, and, and then this is, um, well, the new people should just say their names. Josh. Adam. Also Danny. I guess you'll be Danny M. Uh, I'm Danny M. Oh, fuck. That's weird. Someone needs a nickname. Flasheroo. What? I want everyone to call me Flasheroo. <laughs> fuck yeah, Flasheroo. <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> uh, I'm Eleanor. Hi. Hi, everyone. So today we're ordering from Tanaka, which is Sandy's favorite, but feel free to send in any requests in the future. I mean, it needs to be close-ish, because, well, this is kind of a weird setup, so we're always looking for good new places. Just message me what you want, and, um... Don't be shy about ordering a lot of food. No, yeah, order whatever you want. And, oh, let me know if there are any snacks you want that you don't have. You got great Excellent snacks, Sarah. Snack. Oh, good. Thanks. I got you your favorite. You'll have oh, a lifetime supply. I'm of, addicted you know. to smart food. What? 
Could I get green apples, like Granny Smith's, and some almond butter? Sure. Yeah. Just email me about it so I don't forget. What else? Does everyone have their IDs? They they wouldn't give me one. Why not? They they said there was a problem with my paperwork. Ugh, sorry. I'll call them right now. Thanks. I'll be back for the food order in a bit. She's great. She's she's the sweetest, and if you need anything, she's like super helpful. Sphinxes. What's uni again? Bro. Fat eggs. Oh yeah. Okay, let's see. Uh, should I give my first day spiel? I'll do the short version for the new guys. Um, okay, I'm a pretty nice boss. I don't fire people unless they're complete assholes. You won't work past seven or on weekends. And I don't need you to say smart shit all the time or come up with the best, most brilliant idea. I, I mean, it's great if you do, but the most important thing is that we all feel comfortable saying whatever weird shit comes into our minds. So we don't feel like we have to self-censor and we can just sit around telling stories because that's where the good stuff comes from. I mean, these guys know this. You guys have been through this, right? Yeah. I'd say half the stuff on, on Heathens was just stories from our oh, lives. More than half. Heard from people. What do you say? Oh, uh, uh, more, more than half of the stories were from our lives. Yeah, even more than half. Um, what else? Brian was my assistant for a couple of years and now he's in charge of taking all the notes. So he'll write up everything we say and email it to us at the end of the day. Um, what was I talking about? Embarrassing stories. Yeah, embarrassing or, or just, that's what we're here to do. Tell a really good story. So we should feel comfortable saying whatever and not having to be PC or worry about anyone judging us or anything like that. This is a sacred space and what we say here obviously stays in the cone of silence. The cone. Yes, the, the sacred cone. Remember Alejandra? Oh my God. We're, we're not going to think about her Alejandra. right now. Alejandra. She was, was the worst person. I'll, I'll just... tell you about Alejandra some other time. Anyway, the, the point is that one person can make everyone feel self-conscious or, or judged and uh, yeah, that's the spiel. When it's working, it's fun, and it's like hanging out with friends. Uh, and just to remind you, uh, we can do anything. Jeff and Victor have given me carte blanche. Amazing. Awesome. The rest of the world might be going to hell, but stories are better than ever. And we've been given the opportunity to create something unprecedented. So let's make an impact. Let's make people feel shit they didn't know they were capable of feeling. Let's fuck with everyone's heads and shift their relationship to space and time. Let's make something wild and crazy, but so fucking truthful that, that it gives everyone a new sense of empathy and commonality. We can change the world. What I need from you guys is total commitment when you're here. So I'm going to ask you to turn off your phone when you sit down at this table. Yes. I want you to give yourself over to what we're doing creatively and spiritually. I want you to listen hard and brainstorm harder. And I want you to give me your craziest and wildest ideas. And then we're going to distill those ideas down to something incredibly rigorous and specific. I repeat, we can do anything. But it's about monsters, right? Or a monster? Not necessarily. I thought that's what they said. Told us. What I said, what I said was there's something monstrous, something deformed and, and foreign and terrifying, but it's not necessarily a, a literal monster. Oh, oh, sorry, I guess I just had. <laughs> it's definitely not a dwarf or an elf. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we've got plenty of time to figure it out. Sure. I'll go first. I basically won the lottery. I was a sophomore and I was tiny, like five foot two or something. And I was getting the senior, Jesse, who was gorgeous and had, had these enormous boobs. I mean, like the biggest boobs in our school. Like 
She had to have boob reduction surgery in college. <laughs> Why'd she date you? I don't know. I was good at baseball, and I think she'd been with a lot of, you know, older, sleazy seniors, so she wanted some pathetic little sophomore to be nice to her, <laughs> which I was. I worshipped Jesse. And, uh, let's see. I, I remember she kept bringing up sex, and I kept putting it off because I was terrified. Oh, man. And I was very happy, you know, just to get a couple blowjobs a week from my beautiful older girlfriend, but, you know, one week she kind of insisted, so I remember I didn't want to be one of those guys who came too quickly, so while we were doing it, I went through my entire baseball card collection in my head. <laughs> just card after card, tr trying to remember them all, trying not to think about the fact that I was having sex. And after, she told me I'd lasted longer than any of the other guys she'd been with, so I got to tell that to my friends, and I was pretty fucking happy about it. <laughs> Uh, okay. Mine was kind of confusing. Are you putting this in the notes, Brian? He doesn't have to. You can always say don't put it in the notes, and he won't put it in the notes. Okay. Don't put this in the notes. Uh, actually, no. Fine, you can put it in the notes. Yeah. Mine was kind of confusing, because when I was 16, I kind of uh, put like half of it in my girlfriend after junior prom. Just the tip? It was more than just the tip, but it was for like a second, and it wasn't all of it, and she was like, what do we just do? And then I was like, I don't know. And then we both freaked out. And then for the next few years, I never knew what to say when people asked if I was a virgin, so of course I said I wasn't, but it stressed me out. And then when I was 20, I, uh, my best female friend, my best guy friend and I got drunk at this party. And then we lay out in a field, and uh, we had sex. I mean, we both had sex with her, but it was super consensual, super consensual. It was her idea. Did you touch his dick? I did not. I went first while he, um, you know, and then I lay there off to the side in the grass while they did it. Danny? Danny M2? I'm gonna pass. No passing. I'd like to pass. Fine, you can pass. No more passing. Okay. Um, it was actually really nice. Most of my friends had really weird experiences, but mine was really nice. Um, I was a senior in high school. He bagged groceries at the health food store. I actually ended up moving in with him, which is crazy when I imagine having an 18-year-old daughter moving in with some guy who works at the health food store, but that's what I did. Uh, anyway, it was my 18th birthday, and it was really sweet. And um, I've only told this story to other women and my boyfriends. Um, anyway, it was great. It was my 18th birthday and he made me a carrot cake and I told him that night that I wanted to lose my virginity to him and he said something like, sounds good. And <laughs> I bet. Yeah, um, we did on his couch and um, I was worried it would hurt, but I think I'd actually lost my technical virginity years earlier climbing a fence. I'd kind of sat down in this sharp, like, um, and I had blood everywhere. Uh, but I guess the good part is that when we had sex, it didn't really hurt, or I guess it hurt for like a split second, but then I actually came. We actually came at the same time. Is this too much detail? We came at the same time, and I told all my friends, and none of them believed me because none of them had even had an orgasm. I remember thinking that I was going to have the most amazing sex life, but... Of course, there was like a decade of bad sex ahead of me. But somehow it was just kind of magical with Tony. His name was Tony. I think maybe it was the way his penis sort of bent upward. Oh, uh, I gotta get this. Was that a bad story?
It's pronounced Chimera. No. Chimera. 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 Okay, enough. Chimera. All the women in my family are a little bit monsters. What does that mean? Everyone has a weird thing. What's a weird thing? Well, my sister has two uteruses. That's impossible. I have gills. Gills? You don't have gills. Yes, I do. All fetuses have gills. Mine just stuck around. They're tiny. Holy shit, that little... Fuck me. Wow. Yeah, it's just a pocket. They get infected sometimes, though. Can you breathe underwater? I wish. I don't think those are gills. Why would... You think I'm lying? And, and your sister has two uteruses? Yep, she has two uteruses. It's not all that uncommon. And then my mom is blind in one eye, which kind of makes her a cyclops. And my aunt has alopecia, which means she's totally hairless. Are we really cold? Morning, everyone. Sorry I'm late. How's Rachel? She's fine now. Uh, she thought there was blood in her urine, but I think she just ate a beet salad or something and forgot about it. I once had this crazy thing. Oh, man. This is a weird story. I once had this crazy thing that... Um, I don't know if it was like a male uh, UTI or whatever, but a uh, cone of silence? Cone. cone. Of course. Cone. Okay, uh, this was in, well, I just want to say first of all that this was in the early years of my marriage and I'm like the most loyal husband in the world now. But back right after Sly was born, things were kind of weird between me and Ellen and, you know, we weren't having that much sex. That's what happens. But, but more than that, we were just kind of disconnected. And I, I mean, I felt like she hated me. And right, anyway, cutting to the chase, uh, I started sleeping with other people. Well, that's not true. Th this other woman, this woman that I worked with. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this again. Cone, 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 cone. 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 Anyway, we were having this really hot affair, but we were like, we were friends and and we were crazy attracted to each other, but we both like knew we weren't in love and, and we were both married. And, and we like we like convinced ourselves that we wouldn't actually be cheating on our spouses or, or disrupting the sanctity of marriage, blah, blah, blah. If we just uh, fucked in the ass. If I just experienced. Ow. This is good. So, did that for a while. You I never fucked her, fucked her? I never did. Okay, and, and this was the first and the last time affair that I've ever had. So I do just want to say for the record that I've never actually had um, uh, vaginal intercourse with, with anyone other than my wife. Well, since marrying my wife. Okay, so, so anyway, we're, we're like fucking once a week, all right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we're having like incredible anal sex, like once every week or so. And, and uh, one day I pee and, um, it hurts. It, it just, it really hurts. Uh-oh. Are you wearing a condom? I was not. Oh, so it was boy. What? Gonorrhea? Well, I, uh, I don't know what it was. I get so terrified that I have an STD and I'm gonna have to tell Ellen and so I just go into complete denial mode. So, so I stop fucking this woman at work. But I also stop fucking Ellen because a, I'm in pain, and B, I don't want to give Ellen this STD, and, and it just starts getting worse and worse, and it's like, it's like peeing razors, and, and it's not getting any better, and my dick is like... How much detail do you want? Depends. Lots of detail. <sighs> my dick starts, like, oozing this kind of yellow stuff. Like, like I'll just find... Uh, a drop of yellow oozy pus just sitting on the tip of my dick and, and I'm totally freaking out and I'm too scared to go to the doctor because, well, 
They'll ask me about the kind of sex I've been having. And then one afternoon, Ellen isn't home. And I realize I haven't jerked off in like two weeks because I've been busy running around behind Ellen's back and, and pretending I'm not in excruciating pain. And anyway, I'm home alone for the first time in a while. And I mean, I know I didn't because I'll, I'm sore and, and I'll probably make it worse, but I start jerking off. So I jerk off and, and then I come. And when I come, it's the most like terrifying thing I've ever seen. I basically come blood. Oh. <laughs> I come like this enormous amount of jizz and blood and pus and it hits the shower wall and it's it's like the most disgusting thing in the world. It looks like someone was murdered and I run to the kitchen and I grab the paper towels and I start mopping the blood off of the walls and while I'm mopping the blood off the walls that I suddenly realize I feel fine. I feel fine for the first time in weeks. What? How, how is that even possible? Like, like somehow it, it, uh, whatever it was inside of me just needed to come out. I felt like totally normal again. And I thanked God and I never fucked this other woman again or anyone else except my wife. So you never found out what it was? Nope. And your wife didn't get sick? Nope. Oh. That's a good story. Yeah, uh, what you said actually reminds me of this thing. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if this is totally relevant. No, please. Well, a few years ago, we went up north uh, to my friend's house, and it was really, really cold. I mean, so cold we spent most days inside. But then it was this one morning when it had rained overnight and everything had kind of thawed. And I went by myself in this big pair of boots that didn't belong to me. And I just walked across the field. Like, I didn't stay on the path. I just walked straight into uh, a field. And I realized that it was a cornfield. It was a muddy cornfield full of dead corn husks. And I took one of those loose husks and I put it in my pocket. And then I circled back to the road and I walked up through the fog and I found this pink rock that was beautiful half light pink and half dark pink and I put that in my pocket too and when I got back home I put the husk on the counter and I put the pink rock on the counter and I forgot about them and later that night my wife saw them and she said something like what are those and I looked and for a second I didn't recognize them because they were such muddy sort of crusty objects and inside the house, out of context, they looked kind of horrible. And I was embarrassed and I said, I don't know, which was a very strange thing for me to say because I never lied to my wife. And then I opened the door and I threw them out into the night. What if, what if time, what, what if time had two axes, 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 how do you say that? Axes. Okay, what, what if time had two axes, like horizontal and vertical? Like, how, how do you guys all see time? Do you see it horizontally? Um, no. Yeah, yeah, I see it like a line, like a line going left. To right. Horizontally. I see it kind of vertical. I see it like a spiral. Like vertical, but it's it's cyclical. It's a series of loops, but moving in one direction. Like from up to down, not down to up? Yeah, up to down. I have no idea what we're talking How about. How do you see time? I don't see time. Time isn't something you can see. No, no, no. Just listen. Okay. So... Let's say time, let, let's say time has a vertical axis and a horizontal axis. So it goes like this, what? but it also goes like this. Mm -hmm. And let's say there are certain things, um, cer certain events that if they happen on the horizontal axis, they're He's more like- He's lost his mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, please just let me 
get this out. Okay. There are two kinds of time. There's vertical and horizontal. And if something happens in horizontal time, it can be a, it's not permanent. You, you can reverse it. Like one of them is the time that we think of when we think of time that's moving forward and you can't go back. But then there's another kind of time. And if you do something in that kind of time, you can, it, it, it's more flexible. I like it. Thanks. Uh, why do you think time is like a spiral? Because I guess I just see it spiraling in front of me because certain things happen over again, like certain patterns, but it's always going somewhere. But then there are these repetitions and you always think that you in the past is stupid and the you in the present is smarter, but actually you might just be in a different part of the circle. And in a couple of years, you'll be back at the same spot again, but just further down, further ahead. So you kind of spiral, spiral, spiral until I guess you die. Are you, are you knitting? Yeah, is that okay? You're actually knitting something? Helps me think. What are you knitting? A sweater? <laughs> On the other side of the world, there's a monster who looks exactly like you, doing exactly what you're doing. Wearing the same clothes, eating the same food, going to the same job, thinking the same thoughts, except the monster's doing it all upside down and backwards and in reverse order. He's your shadow and your mere reflection, but you're his too. And then at the end of the world, we're all going to have to figure out who's real and who's the copy and who's sincere and who's joking because one of you is going to heaven and the other is going to hell. We're doing Thai again. Nobody order the pad, see you. Hey, when were you going to tell us your Jerry Madigan stories? Yeah, you keep saying that you'll... I can't believe you knew him. David's heard all my Jerry Madigan stories. <laughs> but I would gladly hear them again. So... <sighs> I watched Paragon like seven times. When Paragon's I... not even his best work. I love Paragon. Paragon is pretty good. All right. Well, Jerry taught me everything I know about journeys and exploits. Jerry taught me everything I know about feats and accomplishments. Jerry taught me everything I know about achievements and deeds. Jerry taught me everything I know about objectives and intentions. Jerry taught me everything I know about tension and opposition. Jerry taught me everything I know about hunches and gut reactions. Jerry taught me everything I know about impressions and responses. Jerry taught me everything I know about sketches and outlines. Jerry taught me everything I know about overviews and assumptions. Jerry taught me everything I know about proposals and suggestions. Jerry taught me everything I know about detours and digressions. Jerry taught me everything I know about inklings and awareness. Jerry taught me everything I know about concepts and perception. Jerry taught me everything I know about drafts and extractions. Jerry taught me everything I know about rundown and condensation. Jerry taught me everything I know about compression and concentration. Jerry taught me everything I know about reinforcement and reduction. Jerry taught me everything I know about growth and escalation. Jerry taught me everything I know about desire and inclination. Jerry taught me everything I know about fulfillment and consummation. Jerry taught me everything I know about execution and implementation. He was a drunk and a bigot, but he never held that against anyone. I started working for him when I was 19. I kind of became the son he never had. He loved women, but he didn't want them around when he was working. <laughs> <laughs>
He was the funniest fucking fuck I'd ever met. I started by getting him coffee. And then I started taking notes for him, just like Brian does for me. And then I became his editor and then his business partner. No one knew more about storytelling than Jerry. He could diagnose your problem in two seconds. I brought my first story to him and he took it apart like it was a broken watch. And when he put it back together again, it started ticking. <laughs> Do you remember if uh, he... in this, this poor Irish family, he had some anecdote about rats in the drinking water or something. I don't remember it exactly. His father was a mean bastard. He used to line him and his sisters up in a row and make them pick the piece of wood they wanted him to beat them with. Jesus. He never studied with anyone. He didn't even finish high school. He developed his system all on his own. And let me tell you, that shit is foolproof. You could apply it to anything in the world. And is it, his book changed my life. It's a great book. Tell him, tell him what he used to say about, about boats, how, how... What do you mean about boats? Uh, like, like if it floats, don't. Uh, I care oh, if it, yeah. <laughs> okay. If it flies, floats, or fucks, rent it. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, will you say that again? If it flies, floats, or fucks, rent it. As opposed to? Buying it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, guys, I, I still don't. Uh, hold on. Um, let's take a 10. Whoa. What? Guess how old the world's oldest animal is. What kind of animal? Guess. A turtle. A pretty long top. Shark? Well, that's interesting, because a shark is mentioned in this article. They just discovered a 400-year-old shark off the coast of Greenland. But that's not the oldest. 400. The oldest animal in the world is the Ming the Clam. She's 507. 500? Ming the Clam. How do they know how old she is? She told them. Hey, she's Icelandic. Yay. But how do they know? She's an Icelandic ocean qua 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 hog. Uh, they counted the rings on her shell. Like a tree, I guess. That's beautiful. But... Oh, shit. They killed her. No! To find out, Ming was unfortunately killed by researchers when they opened her shell to figure out how old she was. Jesus Christ. It's like such an example of how messed up everything is right now. It's just perfect. Ming's status as the oldest animal <sighs> in the world is questionable, though. One species of jellyfish is biologically immortal. Instead of dying, it simply reverts to an earlier age in its life cycle. This means there is no theoretical limit to its lifespan, but also it's impossible to verify its age. Wow. The fuck? Uh, yeah. I know, I'm being bad. I'll put it away in a second. It's my mom. It's not like fun texting. She's the worst. She just like gotten it into her head that my brother and I have to get all our stuff out of her basement. It's not like she's moving or anything, but what she doesn't understand is we don't have basements. We don't have houses with basements. We can put our boxes in. So if she wants to get rid of all of our childhood drawings and papers and toys, then you're just gonna have to throw them all away. So, I do just want to say for the record that Sandy is super not into people texting when we're around the table. I know. I just thought like that- if you really need to send a text, you should probably just pretend to need to use the bathroom and then do it in there. But he's not here right now. Well, yes, but he could pop in at any moment, and it's sort of an honor system thing. It's about vibes in the room and keeping- But things he texts. Well, obviously- but he wants us. No, I get it. 
it was just a weird thing with my mom. I won't do it anymore. You know that smells like farts. Does? Smells like egg. Eggs, Eggs kind of have a farty smell. Maybe. Morning, everyone. Morning. Yeah, and he's running a little late, but he should be here any minute. Josh, I have one more thing for you to sign. Really? I know. I think we're really close, though. Wait, wait. What? What is this? It's did they all have to? Agreement. Did you all have to sign this? Wait, wait. What is it? It's a non-disclosure agreement. But I already this signed a non-disclosure agreement. Different, like a supplemental. I don't remember leave. signing anything like this. I just think when the system gets somebody they don't recognize, um, they get a little suspicious, and then there's a lot more paperwork. Well, thank you, Josh. Uh, do you know when I'm going to get my ID? No one gotten paid yet, huh? Hey, everyone. Hey. Hi. Good morning. Sorry I'm late. Rachel's dealing with another medical thing. Oh, no. Is everything okay? Yeah, she's fine. Her, uh, her ovary just tied itself in a knot and then exploded. Whoa. Oh, no. Sounds worse than it is. She'll be fine. Worst thing that ever happened to you. Sure, I'll go. My dad shooting himself in the face. Oh my God. Really? You know this story. I don't think I do. My mom's mom died that way too. I I've told you this. That's awful. I don't think you did. My mom's mom shot herself in the face when my mom was 17 and my mom was the one who found the body. Fast forward 30 years and I'm in high school and my mom wants to leave my dad because among other things, he's schizophrenic. Although. She knew that when she married him, so I don't get what the big surprise is. But anyway, she wants to leave him after 20 years of marriage. And my dad totally loses his shit. And he makes a sick threat that if she leaves him, he'll kill himself in the exact same way her mom did. And so my mom's like, long story short, she doesn't take him seriously. And she packs up all her shit and goes to a motel for the weekend. And then she comes back to the house to visit me, but I'm staying at my uncle's. So she walks into the living room and what do you know? My dad has kept his word and shot himself in the fucking face. And my mom relives the same trauma all over again and checks herself into an institution. And meanwhile, no one's thinking about me, but again, that's no surprise because no one was really thinking about me in the first place. Does it sound familiar now? Maybe. Dave, I'm... So, okay. no, 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 no pity parties. It made me who I am and it made me want to tell stories. And I ended up living with my uncle and he was the one who introduced me to Stargazer and, and everything else Sandy did. And that was what got me to move out of that shitty town and come here and find Sandy. And it gave me the hunger and the bravery to do that. And now I've got a great job and a decent apartment and a beautiful girlfriend who's like a really sweet, totally normal person. And I never have to go back there or talk to any of those people. So ultimately, as fucked up as it sounds, I'm thankful. So I guess maybe it's the worst thing and the best thing. Biggest regret, Danny. Let's see. Biggest regret. No, no, no. I guess Not you, Flasheroo. The other Danny. Oh, oh, me? Uh, sorry, I, I get... Least regret. Huh. Let me think. Well, 
uh, this one summer when I was a teenager, I lived on a farm and I had a lot of little jobs, but one of them was putting the chickens to bed at night. There were a lot of foxes roaming around. So it was important to get all the chickens in a little, little chicken house uh, by sundown and lock the door behind them and then turn on the fence. And most of the chickens would be in the chicken house already by the time it got dark again. They'd be sleeping or sleepy, and I gotta tell you, there's nothing cuter than a bunch of sleepy chickens nestled up together, all plump, with their eyes drooping shut. But uh, yeah, there would usually be a few stragglers still wandering around, and the guy who gave me the job told me that I was supposed to pick those stragglers up and put them in the chicken house. But for some reason, I was terrified of picking up a chicken. I, I loved them, but the idea of grabbing them and I don't know, I pictured them pecking me or clawing me or me actually hurting them. The only part of it was that I actually wanted to pick, pick the chickens up very badly. There, there was something about their chests, those fluffy alive chicken breasts. And I loved the idea of holding them firmly but lovingly in my hands. I just couldn't picture it going the right way, like how to do it. And so I would, I would hurt the chickens or be hurt by the chickens. So I actually would wait until like way after sundown, like 10, 30, 11 PM. And that's when I would go lock the chicken house door and turn on the fence. And by that time, all the chickens had gone into the house and fallen asleep on their own. But I was really playing with fire because the fox could have come on before then. I mean, something really bad could have happened in that two hour window. But I was so scared of picking up a chicken that I, I didn't tell anyone. And I took that risk every night. Luckily, no chickens died that summer, but they could have. So I guess my regret is that I didn't ask for a well, oh, I didn't just ask someone to give me a tutorial on how to hold a chicken. That's your... Nothing bad happened. But it could have. And I guess... I guess what it's about is this sense I've always had that there's some secret, there's something in this life I don't fully have access to. Maybe it's a a certain kind of joy, I'm not sure. And that summer with the chickens, I really do feel like if I just picked them up, something would have changed in me and my life might be very different now. Uh, sorry, I feel like I should say something. I really heard what you all said the first day about our stories, uh, about our, our personal stories being the material for being part of the inspiration for the work. I, I really understand that, I think. But uh, sometimes when I tell personal stories to you guys, like just now, it, it doesn't feel real. It, it feels misleading. What do you mean misleading? Afterwards, I feel like I made something up, even though I didn't. There's not enough context or I, I'm telling the story because I think you want me to tell a story. And then I'm trying to figure out how you all see me in relation to the story. And I, I can tell the way you're seeing me is not the way I am. It, it just gets so personal. And I guess I've, I've always felt like my personal life is the part of my life that I don't want to turn into a story. I also just want to add that I feel really lucky to be here and I really respect everyone in this room and I really respect what we're doing.
guess we're on a 10. Did you know that a whale off the coast of Brazil can hear what a whale is saying all the way off the coast of Alaska? Something about the way the ocean transmits sound? I like that. So if you're a whale, you're like hearing every other whale in your hemisphere all talking at the same time. Well, not talking. Hey, um, like Danny M? Whale. Danny M2? Sandu was wondering if he could talk to you for a second. Yeah. Yeah, of course. And so the only way to kill the monster is to find his heart, but his heart is on an island on the other side of the world. And on that island, there's a church. And inside that church, there's a well. And inside that well, there's a duck. And inside that duck, there's an egg. And inside that egg is his heart. So if you want to just kill him, you're probably not going to make it out alive. Imagine a world like ours with clocks and calendars, but all the clocks tell a different kind of time. So you know how there are like certain insects and they only live a couple of days, but those days must go by really slowly, you know, because they're like literally a lifetime. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so imagine a world just like ours, but the time the clock is telling is, um, well, so a day could actually be a century. Like the clock face is measuring years. Or it could be the opposite, an hour on the clock, or what looks like an hour on the clock is actually a second, or, or a millisecond. So it's a totally different world, but it appears the same. But to them, a millisecond is a lifetime, or a or hundred years is a minute. Do you guys know what the yuga is? It's this, it's this Hindu cyclical idea of time in the universe. And the idea is that we're always in one of four ages. Uh, yugas. And when you're done with the fourth yuga, you cycle back to the first. And each yuga is like hundreds of thousands of years long. And each one is worse than the one that came before. So like right now, we're living in something called the Kali Yuga, which is the most, like, demonic, fucked up age you can be in. And at the end of this Yuga, the universe will return to some, like, primordial ocean state for the length of all the past four Yugas put together. And then everything will start over, and people will be, like, nice to each other again. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um... I mean, that's a little different from what I was saying, but like, yeah, that, that's cool. Um, so, so what I was saying was that maybe there's a world where like people are experiencing, their world just measures time differently. How do we, how do we tell that story though? What, what do you mean? If their minute is our century or our minute is their decade or whatever, how do we tell the story of, are we telling the story in our time or in theirs? Yeah, maybe there's a, maybe that would be the point. What would be the point? Like messing with all of that and. Oh, sorry. I didn't realize you meant me. I thought you were talking to. I meant some... you. Wow. Um, okay. I feel kind of on the spot. Well, um, hmm. I guess only Sandy knows this, but my mom died when I was 13. Oh, shit. Oh, that's awful. Yeah, I mean, it's okay. I mean, it's not okay. It's super sad, but it's like my life, so, yeah. Anyway, um, I kind of had this crazy experience, like, one year after she died. Sandy, you really want me to tell them about this? 
well, my dad remarried pretty quickly and my stepmother and I didn't really get along. She was kind of this, well, she was like this sort of makeup y like, she came from a lot of inherited wealth. And my mom was like, well, she was a social worker and she and my dad were always just trying to make ends meet. And then like six months after my mom dies, we're like living in this big house on the other side of town because my dad remarried and I'm supposed to be super excited about it, but it just feels, I mean, the house feels big and creepy and lonely. And my stepmother already has two daughters and one of them's in college, but the other one's around my age and like, she's this like popular girl who goes to private school and like clearly hates me and she and my stepmother are like super girly. Anyway, wait, you guys really want to hear this? This isn't boring? Keep, keep no. going. Okay. Well, at one point my dad went on a business trip and I was alone with my stepmother and my stepsister for two weeks. And one night my stepmother was cooking dinner and she said that she didn't have any um, rosemary for the slam stew she was making. So she told me to walk down the street and go to the little blue house at the end of the cul-de-sac and to ask the old woman who lived there if she had any rosemary we could borrow. But I was scared. Everyone at my school said the little blue house was haunted and that the old woman who lived there was a witch. So I'm standing in my bedroom trying to decide what to do when this doll my mom gave me right before she died starts talking to me. And the doll says, Don't be afraid. Just do what you're told, but don't forget to bring me with you. So I walk down the street and it's dark and kind of creepy. And when I get to the little blue house, I realize for the first time that the fence, which has always just seemed like plain painted white wood to me, is actually made out of bones. And on the top of every post is a human skull. So I knock on the door and this old lady opens it and she looks like a million years old. And I ask her if she has any rosemary and she says she has to check first and... Oh shoot. Jeff, I should get it. Did Jeff say he was going to call? He said later today or tomorrow. I'm going to get it just in case. Sorry, guys. Hello? Yeah, Fucking right. dolls. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, It wasn't Jeff. Why is he calling at all? I think he wanted to check in about the schedule and see if there's any way I he can. Schedule? There's no problem with the schedule. We're on schedule. Great. When you talk to him, tell him we're on schedule because I don't want to talk Great. to him. Yeah, he knows we're on schedule. I think he just likes to feel included and so he was reaching out to see if there's anything we need or anything he can help with and I, Oh yeah, on top of every post was a human skull. So I'm terrified, obviously. And yeah, I knock on the door and this old lady opens it and she looks like a million years old. And I ask her if she has any rosemary and she says she has to check first that why don't I come inside? And like, this feels like a really, really bad idea. But the doll whispers to me that I should do as I'm told and go inside. And so I go inside and it's basically like my worst nightmare. The old woman locks me in a room and tells me that she's going to put me in the oven and eat me unless I clean her whole house and separate the moldy corn from the good corn by the next day at sundown. Oh yeah, she has this like enormous vat of corn kernels. Maybe I forgot to mention that. It's like an impossible task. So I'm freaking out, but then the doll says to me, go to sleep. Morning is wiser than evening. And when I wake up in the morning, my awesome doll has already cleaned the entire house and separated all the thousands of moldy kernels of corn from the good kernels of corn. And when the old woman gets home that night, she can't believe it. And she gets really mad because she was planning on eating me for dinner. And then she gives me another task for the next day. 
Now I have to clean every single kernel of corn until it's shiny and bright, and I have to do it before sundown. It's another impossible task because there are like tens of thousands of kernels of corn. So that night, the same thing happens. I cry in my room and then the doll says, go to sleep. Morning is wiser than evening. And then when I wake up in the morning, my awesome doll has already cleaned every single kernel of corn. And when the old woman gets home that evening hungry for dinner, she can't believe that all the corn is clean. She gets really mad and yells, how did you do all the work that I gave you? And I just say, I did it with the blessing of my mother. Because my mother did give me the doll, and I didn't want to say, like, the doll did it for me. Anyway, right after I say that, the old woman gets really scared, and she yells at me, I don't want any blessings in my house. And she pushes me out the front door and down to the gate that's made of human bones and skulls. Then she takes one of the skulls and puts it on a pole for me and says, this will light your way home. And sure enough, there's fire inside the skull and it burns through the eyes and lights my way back to my stepmother's house. When I get back home, I try to hide the skull in my mother's driveway so my stepmother doesn't hide out. But then I hear this little voice coming out of the skull. It's saying, don't throw me away. Take me to your stepmother. So I bring the skull inside and it stares at my stepmother mother and stepsister with these burning eyes. The eyes follow them wherever they go. The eyes burn right into their evil souls. By the next morning, they had both turned to ash. That's it. Did everyone send me their lunch orders? Should be here by one, the latest. Hello? Oh, 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 there you all are. Hi. Hey. hey. So nice to meet you. Why don't you all introduce yourselves? Uh, hey, Max. You know me. Oh, yes, hey. hello, Dave. Uh, Danny. Yes, He's Danny. Back. I remember Danny. Hello. Josh. Adam. Eleanor. Brian. Brilliant. Hello, everyone. This is a team, Max. Yes, yes, it, 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 great, and it's it, in every way. How are you, Max? I'm doing quite well, sitting here in my kitchen, and it's finally sunny after a few days of clouds, and I'm very happy to talk to all of you. Well, we're, we're really happy to talk to you, too. You've got a lot of big fans in this room. <laughs> well, you already all know how you are going to be working with Sandy. I just want to say, Sandy, how lucky I feel to be embarking on um, another journey with you. Ethan's was such a success in every way, uh, artistically, financially. We're thrilled you want to make something else with us. I'm thrilled too. I'm thrilled too. So just wanted to check in with what you all are thinking. I obviously want to give you a lot of... But we're all eager to know what you're cooking up and that... Well, Max, it's it's only been, what, five or six weeks, so we've been doing a lot of talking, uh, a lot of getting to know each other. You know how I like to kind of break everyone down and make them tell me stories from their childhood and uh, all that. Yep, yep. Uh, and, and we're we're also asking each other big questions uh, about time and space and the nature of what we all do for a living. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it sounds very. Uh, it, 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 it. So we're we're asking each other questions like, uh, what would communication look like without time? 
Does God think in generals or particulars? What if effects came before causes and answers before questions? Can you have meaning without matter? Because we've been, we've been talking uh, about the fact that whales and, and dolphins are telling each other stories all the time, but they're doing it without words or pictures or objects. What if we could do that for this project, Max? What if we could tell the story that's the only story that we all need to know and we didn't even have to write it down or, or, or turn it into code or hire actors? If you think about the greatest thinkers in, in world history, Jesus, Socrates, Confucius, none of those guys recorded anything or, or wrote anything down. We know about them. We know through other people telling stories about their stories. Could we go back to the beginning? Could we remake our collective unconscious? And Dave had this, uh, this, well, Dave, why don't you tell him? Really? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, well, uh, Sandy can tell you I see everything, including time in terms of circles and spirals. In, in terms of loops, I'm the loop guy. And so Sandy and I have been talking about a story that's a kind of Euroboros, a, a snake eating its own tail. So there's a point at which, without realizing it, you come back full circle and picture this visual. You actually encounter yourself, but from behind. Okay, picture taking a hike and think you've walked in a straight line, but then suddenly you find yourself back where you started and you're staring at your old self the self who stood there at the beginning of the hike, tying his shoelaces, but you're looking at the back of his head. You still there, Max? Yes, yes. Although I, I think you lost me when you was talking about snakes eating their own tails. <laughs> well, forget about that, Max. That's not the important part. Well, it, 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 Eddie Stuff. Mm -hmm. Say that again. It sounds like you're getting into stuff. Yeah. Yeah, we are. But ultimately, you know, what we love about you is your ability to just tell a really simple st to reel people in and make them Sure, sure. Well, you seem like a lovely group. Yeah, Me too. Watch. Uh, I'm going to sign off now because the dog is looking a bit anxious and pulling out the back door, and I, I think he needs to go take a wee. Thanks for listening, Max. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Meeting you. Hi. Nice meeting you. Well, that that was pretty cool. I can't believe that was him. He looks so old. I thought he looked great. Yeah, but he used to be so sexy. He's still a good looking guy. Yeah, but he's clearly had a facelift. He has not had a facelift. Yes, he has. Yes, he has. Oh my god. Men can never tell. He's had his face lifted and his eyelids done and they shaved away some of his chin and those are hair implants. We're insane. I would met he has you not had plastic surgery. That is so can not his Can please just be quiet for 30 seconds so I can hear myself think? Where do I begin? Well, first of all, the things she said never had anything to do with the things we were talking about. We'd be breaking a story, and Alejandra would say, out of nowhere, she'd say, uh, did anyone know there's a, a solar eclipse? Or, or, or have you heard about the, the she war? She had insane dietary restrictions. Okay. Oh, like, yeah. Not just about like what she ate. No, she couldn't even be in the same room as certain... Barbecue sauce. Yeah, she couldn't be in the same room as barbecue sauce. Once I had barbecue sauce on my sandwich, 
and she smelled it and ran like puking to the bathroom. How many sick days did she take? Uh, oh, 13, 14. She was gone at least one day every week with some crazy mysterious illness. So then when she came back, we'd have to spend an hour filling her in. Everything offended her. Everything offended her. She would say about everything, oh, that's offensive. No, 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 no. Remember, she'd be like, I'm yeah, sorry. That... <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's offensive. <laughs> that's what she sounded like. She knew I couldn't fire her. She made it very clear that if I fired her, she'd start trouble. <laughs> but she was also in love with Sandy. Uh, I don't know about that. Oh, she yeah. was in love with Sandy. She was always offended, but somehow she was also always flirting with everyone. <laughs> she would talk about how unhappy she was in her marriage. She yeah, yeah. Like, we'd all get here in the morning and she'd go, I'm thinking about leaving my husband. Like, like just like that. And we're all putting up with her craziness. Like, okay, whatever. This woman is clearly crazy, but we're just going to put up with it and not say anything. And then. And then, HR calls. It was so bad. One day, HR calls and says, someone in the room is feeling uncomfortable. Someone is feeling like it's a hostile work environment. Can you believe yeah. that? That was the phrase, hostile work environment. And I was like, hmm, uh, is it Alejandra? Because she's constantly <laughs> bitching about how offensive everything is. And they say they can't answer that question. So the next morning, Everyone gets here and, and very politely, I'm like, look guys, I got a call from HR and they say one of you is saying it's a hostile work environment. Let's talk about it. Let's just be direct and talk about it right now as a group and we'll yeah. figure it out and we'll make it less hostile. So just speak up and tell me what's bothering you and we'll talk about it. No one says anything. Everyone's just looking at me including Alejandra. Most awkward moment ever. And I say again, I say, let's talk about it. Just tell me what's bugging you, I say. And I make direct eye contact with her and she says nothing. She just stares at me. And I'm like, okay, well, unless someone says something to my face right now, I'm gonna assume we're all happy clams and please, for fuck's sake, don't go ratting on me to HR. If you have a problem, come talk to me. And the same goes for all of you, by the way. Yeah, of yeah. course. I'm a nice guy. I can take it. Just don't rat me out. And then. And then, the next day, she doesn't show up. She just doesn't come in. And I assume she's sick because she's always sick. But usually she calls Sarah to tell her. But this day, she doesn't call and no one has any idea where she is. So Sarah tries her cell phone and there's no answer. And we're like, okay, weird, fine. She'll just show up late, but she never shows up late. And Sarah tries her again at the end of the day. Hey, Sarah, Alejandra, how many times did you try her that day? The first day she didn't come in. Um, three, four. And you sent her emails too, right? Yeah, I was really worried. So Sarah sends her all these nice emails, and, and, and thank you, Sarah, that's all, and, and, and tries her, her cell phone and gets no response, nothing. And, and, and did her phone go straight to voicemail? Yeah. Her phone goes straight to voicemail. <laughs> and, and, and we're like, well, weird. And my first thought is maybe she decided to quit after I made my little speech, which honestly was kind of a relief to me since she put such a huge damper on the creative vibes in the room. <laughs> a huge yes. damper. Uh, there was no way I could have fired her without getting in trouble. So I think, well, okay, good. Y you know, this job wasn't for her. Maybe she's gonna amicably quit, you know? Uh, and then a few hours later, we get this panicked call from Jeff and I'm suddenly worried she's suing me for sexual harassment or something crazy, you know? And, and, but then Jeff, Jeff says, get this, Jeff says, Alejandra's husband is wondering where she is because she didn't come home the night before. What? That's, so then. And then these calls from Alejandra's extended family start pouring in. She's gone. 
No one has any idea where she is. And then? That's it. She disappeared. She never came back. That's so, that's she horrible. She evaporated. Was she murdered? No one ever found any evidence of it. Nobody. I think she just took off. She was batshit crazy and then she took off. Remember how she was like obsessed with um, Bora Bora? <laughs> yeah, maybe she's like sitting on a beach in Bora Bora. <laughs> yeah. And later, by the way, I said to Jeff, this is why you shouldn't make me hire a woman or, or, or a Chinese person or whatever unless I meet that person and I want to hire them. Don't strong arm me into hiring people I don't want to hire. <laughs> you know, they could, they could turn out to be crazy and that doesn't do any of us any good. Sandy? Don't tell me it's Jeff. It's Victor. What does Victor want? Yeah, okay. Give me five minutes. What time is it? 8.45. I thought he had said we were never going to work past seven mm -hmm. dinner plans. It's not a big deal. Once on Heathens, we were here till like three in the morning. This is a great job, you guys. A lot of people would kill to have this job. I miss Danny. The other Danny. Has anyone talked to him? I liked him. Me too. I liked him, but I wouldn't say I miss him. Oh, anybody want a probiotic? Sure. Sure. You know what I think would be cool? If we could, I mean, science must be able to. There's gotta be a way to just like attach electrodes to people's brains and stimulate the parts of the brain that respond to story, like in specific story elements. So you could make people feel all the things they would feel during a romance or an adventure or happy ending and there would still be an art to it because you'd be figuring out which synapses to stimulate when and for exactly how long but this whole thing where we have to make up some fictional world or some fictional series of events or narrative concepts would be over and if you wanted to do something new it would just be coming up with a new um, yeah, algorithm a new sequence which is really what it is anyway. We all pretend there's something magic about it, but it's actually just algorithms. Y you don't really think that. I do. I do. I, I think it would be such a relief. Don't you? Morning, everyone. Morning. 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 Sandy's sorry, but he's not going to be able to make it in today. He had another emergency conference call with Jeff and Victor last night, and he's exhausted. But he said to keep um, spitballing without him, and he's excited to see what you've come up with tomorrow. Why was it an emergency conference call? It wasn't. You just said it was an emergency conference call. I did? Yeah. I don't know why I said that. That's so strange. What do you mean by that? Sometimes certain stories. I mean, Sandy's a genius, but, but sometimes not all of his stories work out. But what does that mean? Sometimes they get canceled, or, or sometimes he pulls the plug on them. Pulls the plug? Sometimes he realizes the idea isn't right, or, or the room isn't right, and so he pulls the plug. Were you in a room that the, where, where the plug got pulled? But the, the room before my first room was brutal. I probably shouldn't be telling you guys this, but basically 
everyone was pretty much fired and then he pulled the plug. Brian, you were the you were the Sarah to that room, right? Mm -hmm. How do you how do you know if he's gonna pull the plug? Are there any warning signs? Um well he usually just stops coming in. <laughs> this is different though. Uh, okay, what happens if you're not fired but he pulls the plug? You go home. You get paid? You still get paid and you go home. That sounds nice. It's not nice! <laughs> Are you kidding? It means the room was a failure! It, it means you were all working together for months for nothing! It means you wasted Sandy's time! It means you wasted everyone's time! We're all so lucky to be here! It, it took me years of work to get here! And I'm not interested in wasting time. Hey guys, Sandy feels terrible about this, but it's the twins' birthday today and they're having a treasure hunt with over a hundred kids and Rachel still isn't feeling well, so he's not gonna be able to make it in. He says to tell you, Hey guys, I have really sad news. Sandy's therapist died. Oh, that's so sad. Oh, he's not going to be able to make it in today. I mean, they're not sure she should. when the funeral is happening yet, but he'll know more in a few. Hey guys. This one is my bad, but I totally forgot Sandy is giving the keynote speech at this conference today. Anyway, he's going to be there today and tonight, but he said to tell you to keep going and keep on um, breaking stories. I think he said something about breaking the story open, and also that you guys are geniuses, and he's... Hey. You're back. I only have a few minutes, but oh, I just, no. is oh. everything okay? Yeah, everything's fine. Rachel's doing a little bit better, but things are pretty crazy, so I, I gotta head home in a few minutes. Of Thanks course. Send her our love. I just wanted to remind all of you that what you're doing is important. We need stories as a culture. It's what we live for. These are dark times. Stories are a little bit of light that we can cup in our palms like votive candles to show us the way out of the forest. Every single one of you was changed by a story at some point in your life or else you wouldn't be here, right? Think back to that time when you were a little kid and a story changed your life. Do that right now. The stories we create teach people what it's like to be someone else on a visceral level. As storytellers, we know how to shift perspective and inhabit different viewpoints. Imagine what would happen if everyone in the world could do every once in a while what we already do on a daily basis. It would be revolutionary. Yep, I gotta go. Stay safe in this crazy weather. Wait, wait, Sandy. I, I'm so sorry to keep you here, but um, yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, it's been more than three months, and I actually still haven't been paid. Are all of you being paid? Yeah. Yeah. Did you talk to Sarah? Yeah, yeah, Sarah's been great, um, but it, it, it's still not happening. I've jumped through a lot of hoops and filled out a lot of papers, and um, yeah, I, I also still don't have my ID, and every day when I come in, I have to wait in line and show my passport to security and get my picture taken. I'm re really sorry to bring it up now. I realize it's a 
bad time. I need to go deal with some stuff at home. Yeah, yeah, of course. Can we talk about this later? Yeah, yeah, of, of course. Uh, sorry, I, I know I jumped the gun. Sorry, everyone. Did you fill your bathtub? <laughs> I don't believe in filling my bathtub. <laughs> what I'm worried is if that I fill mean? my bathtub, it's going to crash through my neighbor's ceiling. I filled my bathtub. I bought 10 almond butters. Do you get flashlights? I bought five flashlights. Is Sarah still here? Sarah? Hi, guys. We were wondering how late you were going to stay today. I'll stay as long as you guys stay. No, I'm don't have to do that. Do that. <laughs> no way. I'm manning the phones and I'm here if you need anything. Do you think Sandy would be okay with us leaving early today? Well, I know he was hoping you could stick around this weekend just because we're behind schedule and Jeff and Victor are freaking out a little bit, but it'd be great to have some ideas to show him on Monday. But of course, I mean, he doesn't want you to feel like you're putting yourselves in danger or anything. So if you feel nervous about it, we can let him Never go. mind, never mind. We're not going home. I can order you all dinner. I called Huey's and they're doing delivery till nine. Great. Thanks. Just let me know if you need anything. You guys are awesome. Yay. Thanks, Sarah. And if it is the apocalypse, you can all live off of your smart food and green apples. And start a new society. Fuck. I had my toothbrush. Can I make a confession? I feel a tiny bit excited. There are seven types of stories in the world, okay? Rags to riches, the quest, killing the monster. How is the quest different from killing the monster? You're, you're, you're trying to get somewhere. You're trying to get to the castle or the, or the golden fleece, and you might kill a monster along the way, but, but the point isn't killing the monster. Okay? Mm. Ready? Rags to riches, the quest, killing the monster. Voyage and return, comedy, tragedy, and rebirth. Rebirth is about deciding to change and become a better person. There are 36 types of stories in the world. Supplication, crime by vengeance, Pursuit, disaster, abduction, murderous adultery, vengeance for kin upon kin, fatal imprudence, madness, self-sacrifice for ideals, self-sacrifice for passion, all sacrifice for passion, obstacles to love, conflict with a god, mistaken jealousy, erroneous judgment, loss of loved ones, recovery of loved ones. Is that 36? That was like 19. Rivalry of superior versus inferior. Ambition. An enemy loved. And murderous adultery. There are 10 types of stories in the world. Okay, so there's a threshold crossing, a, a brother battle, a dragon battle, dismemberment, crucifixion, abduction, uh, a terrible storm, a night sea journey, a wonder journey, or a journey into the belly of a whale. You make a sigil when just wanting something isn't enough and normal chaos magic isn't working. Actually, sometimes wanting something is bad, because then you're, like, ego-driven, and you get all anxious and afraid of failure. So you have to make a symbol or a mantra that you can put all of your energy into and then forget about. 
So let's say, for instance, your wish is, um, I want to meet a succubus in a dream. Mm -hmm. Then you write it out phonetically. I want to meet a succubus in a dream. I want to meet a succubus. You in a dream. I and get it. Then you erase all the letters you don't like. And then you rearrange those letters. Ah, uh, and Subius. And then that's your finished mantra, and you erase everything else. Ah, Kusimen Subis. But that's not our wish. What is our wish? To make a fuck make ton of money. Proud. To come up with the right story. We want to come up with the right story. We want to come. <laughs> Come up with the right story. We want to come up with the right story. Let me do some racing. Wa to Kumep. Dar store. Awi putem rad trots. 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 This is the chaos sphere. It means when you want to shake off human limitations and tap into the powers of the universe, you have to stop worrying about being nice. You have to embrace chaos and darkness. You have to be willing to perform monstrous acts. I think I just heard the rain. I don't think you'd be able to hear it from here. There are only 18 types of stories in the world. First, the void. Then the first void. Then the second void. Then the vast void. Then the far extending void. Then the seer void. Then the unpossessing void. And then... <laughs> the delightful. Then the void fast bound. And then the night. Then the hanging night, then the drifting night, then the morning, and then the, da the daughter of troubled sleep, and then the dawn, 
then the abiding day, and the bright day, and then space. Sandy says that this feeling is inevitable. Sandy says that this horrible, hopeless feeling is the feeling you get right before it happens. How does it happen? We just have to resist the, the urge to sleep or, or go home, and we have to keep talking to each other and telling each other stories, and eventually it'll become clear. Who has a story? No one has a story? Please, God, just someone tell a fucking story! You tell a story! I've... run out! Once upon a time... There was nothing, just the vast depths, and the spirit of the Great Father, alone in these depths. He was the depths, and the depths were him. I can't tell you how lonely it was for him, just, just floating in nothingness, alone in a silent universe. And one day his loneliness was so acute that he grew anxious and his anxiety created a lot of a lot of energy just a lot of buzzing spinning energy and so the great father sat and he concentrated all his energy and with that lonely anxious energy he produced a being out of his forehead something something alive it it sprang from his forehead but it was monstrous it was a giant with many heads and 7,000 tongues and 15,000 arms, and it was stupid and angry. It was a first try, but it needed to eat. So the great father concentrated and concentrated, and, and out of his asshole sprang a cow, a sacred proto-cow. Her name was Bessie, and she provided his monstrous child with milk. And then one day, Bessie was just standing there, and she started licking at some gray stones that were lying at her feet. And lo and behold, as she licked them, the gray stones began forming into heads, the heads of gods, two brothers and a sister. And they sprang up, and they looked around, and they saw the nothingness, and they saw their older brother, the deformed, stupid giant with his thousands of heads and arms, and they fell upon him with their divine swords, and they murdered him. And out of his dead body they fashioned the world. His veins became rivers, his bulbous nose became the tallest mountain, they picked the dandruff off his scalp and threw it into the sky, and it became the stars. And the two brothers and the sister frolicked in this world that was the corpse of their dead, giant monster brother, and, and they built a golden palace where his belly used to be but soon they were bored. So the sister fucked her older brother and then gave birth to a wolf. And then she fucked her younger brother and gave birth to a serpent. And then she fucked the great father, which no one even knew was possible. And from this fucking, she was pregnant for a very long time. It was a difficult pregnancy. It was about a hundred years long. And during it, she was cared for by her sons, the wolf and the serpent. And when it was finally time, she gave birth to so many babies. She gave birth to the year, and then she gave birth to the month, and then she gave birth to the seasons, and then she gave birth to the minute, and then she gave birth to the second. 
Then she gave birth to the day, and the night, and the days of the week, and then she gave birth to dawn, and then twilight, and then she gave birth to time, and death, and finally, she gave birth to disease. And she gave all these things her breasts to suck on. And the wolf and the serpent grew jealous of all their new siblings, who were concepts and not animals, and they grew angry at their mother for not paying them enough attention. And so they cut off her head and threw it up into the sky, and it became the moon. Oh, but before they cut off their mother's head, they raped her. And before she died, these tiny little fleshy creatures crawled out of her mouth. And those were the first people. And it's unclear to this day whether people came from wolves or from serpents, since the wolf and the serpent raped their mother at the same time. And the wolf and the serpent and the brother gods and the great father looked at these two little fleshy creatures, man and woman, so tiny and vulnerable, and their hearts melted. And they came together in a kind of truce to take care of these innocent creatures. And they made trees, and they made edible plants, and even Bessie bore a miniature calf out of her eyeball that the man and the woman could take care of and call their own. And they all built a little garden for the man and the woman and told the man and the woman that they could stay there and be happy forever. And they were happy, until one day the woman saw her older half-brother, the serpent, sliding through the garden on his belly. And she was jealous that he could slither anywhere he wanted in the world. So she climbed on his back and she traveled with him across the entire world. She, through the ocean, where she saw the octopi and the whales, through the forest, where she saw the nymphs and the satyrs, to the secret place on the other side of the world, where the gods banished all the mistakes they had made. She saw people with horns and people with penises growing out of their foreheads and men with uteruses for mouths. She saw creatures with dog bodies and cat heads and cat bodies and monkey heads. She saw people with feet for heads and heads for feet. She saw all these hideous creatures and she waved and smiled at them and they waved and smiled back as the serpent slithered his way around the world. And then when she returned to the garden, she told the man about what she'd seen, about the nymphs, and the octopi, and the dog people, and the cat people, and the uterus mouth people. And that, um, th that was the first story ever told. But there, there were... Hold on. So sorry to interrupt. But, Brian, are you really not taking notes on this? What? Are you fucking kidding? You haven't been taking notes? Uh, he never haven't you been taking notes, notes? With me or Adam talking? Sorry, I don't, I don't feel so good. Well, well oh, I don't give a I'm shit. Really You're supposed nauseous. to be writing everything down, and this is the only interesting thing anyone but me has said in the past four months. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm... <coughs> that, uh... You need to go home. Right go now. home, Brian. Please don't tell Sandy about this. <laughs> Can you remember what you were saying? I, I don't know. I, I, I was kind of just bullshitting. Can, can, can you keep going? I, I guess. Hey, Sarah. Hi guys. What time is it? Um, it's like six in the morning. Any word from Sandy? Yeah, apparently one of his houses got hit really hard by the storm. What? Oh, horrible. Yeah, really scary. A lot of water damage and I think a trampoline blew into the ocean or something? Mm. Well, it's lucky they were in their other house. Also, as you know, Rachel is sick, but now it seems like Sullivan and Samantha have the flu, and their nanny just called in sick, so Sandy's going to be out for the rest of the day. But he says he thinks you guys are going to come up with something amazing without him. He says he has total faith in you. Is there anything else you guys need? Well, Brian just left. Cause... Yeah, I saw him run out. So we don't have anyone to take notes. Wait, are you saying you want me to do it?
I mean, if you have the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, if the phone starts ringing in a few hours, I'll have to answer it because Jeff and Victor are breathing down my neck. But yeah. Yeah, I could totally do that. Hold on. Let me get my stuff. Um, I'm ready. Whatever you guys are. Um, I, I, I don't remember what I, what I was... And that was the first story ever told. Oh, yeah, um... That was the first story ever told. But there were spies in the garden, two crows named Chewy and Cha-Cha. And they heard the woman's story and flew back to the gods and told them what had happened. So the gods punished the woman by giving her pain in childbirth and... And... And periods? Periods. Yeah. And they told her never to leave the garden or tell stories again. But late at night, she would whisper the stories into the man's ear anyway. And soon the man and the woman grew so preoccupied with telling each other's stories that they neglected the plants in their garden. And then the gods turned their backs on humans and invented war and watched generation after generation of people kill each other and then tell each other stories about it. And eventually the wars reached the friendly, peaceful, penis-headed monsters on the other side of the world. And they were wiped out. Completely. I guess that's it. I might be able to remember the first part if I go home and get some sleep. Maybe we can take the rest of the weekend off and show this to Sandy on Monday. I mean, he seems pretty preoccupied. I, I won't say anything. God. Awesome work, you guys. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> So, my mom's whole basement was flooded, but I rescued these things to show you guys. <clears throat> my secret diary from when I was nine. It's locked? Yeah, that's why it's a secret diary. See, it says keep out. You could pick that lock in like two seconds. I'm not ready to read it yet. Maybe I'll give it to my daughter if I ever have a daughter. And... Then this is Elvis. I couldn't believe my mom still had him. Thought it'd be funny to bring it in. Remember? No dwarves or elves or trolls. Yeah. No uh. trolls. And guess who this is? Oh, so sweet. You kind of look like a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And then this is a witch's head I made when I was six from carving an apple and then drying it on the windowsill. Ah, yes. And these are the first stories I ever wrote. Well, I didn't really write them. I. Everyone. Sandy. Oh, hey. hey. How's Rachel? She's, um, she's okay. She's having a bit of a hard time. Uh, some intense female stuff. I think she's going to be okay. Our beach house is fucked, though. That's horrible. Sorry I've been gone for such a long time. It's been a wild ride. You guys come up with anything you're excited about? Well, Adam had this. Yeah, it's okay. It's fine. I've been thinking. I think, um, I think it might be impossible what we're trying to do. I've been in a real existential. It's like my life, but it's not my life. You know? 
I think maybe there are no more stories. Not that we've told all the stories or there are only six types of story or something, but I think it's the end of an era or maybe it should be the end of an era. Like maybe this is actually the worst possible time in the history of the world to be telling stories. You know, the, um, like the different, different ages, like what were you telling us about? The yugas? Yeah, the yugas. Maybe we have to move into the next yuga. Maybe all this shit has to burn down first. I, I think maybe this yuga can't handle another story. At least that's where I'm at this week. Um, what does this mean? For what? For the project, I guess. For you and, and for us. Oh yeah, well, I think I'm gonna head up north for a while. We've got this great little cabin near the border. It's in the middle of forests and uh, the air always smells like eucalyptus. Rachel's thinking she might homeschool the twins for a couple of years, and I'd like to take some time off to learn she maybe write my memoir. What about us? Oh, you guys should take it easy. Uh, and I'll make sure Jeff pays you for the next month or two or until you find another gig. Uh, I talked to Max and Victor, and we're going to go on indefinite hiatus. Um, yeah, maybe you should all think about going into a different line of work until the next yuga. <laughs> I think the next yuga is like 300,000 years away. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Uh, I'm really tired. Did you order lunch? Yeah, there's a new Tibetan place like a mile away. I ordered yak butter tea. I got like a chicken thing for you. Great. Great. Sandy, I have to say, I'm feeling kind of- Who are those? Oh, these are from my mom's basement. They were in the only box of stuff that didn't get ruined in the storm. I wrote them when I was four. Well, I didn't really write them because I couldn't write yet. I dictated them to my mom. I also illustrated them. <laughs> Want to hear one? Sure. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Once about the time, a little girl, she went out in the forest. And she always checked there to check if anything was there. Nothing was there, except one day she saw a rattlesnake. So she ran out of the forest. The end. It's a classic. Here's the picture. Just another one. Um, okay. <clears throat> Once about the time, there was a fire in the forest and some people was camping out and they didn't know a fire was on because they was asleep. So they got killed. Oh. The end. <laughs> oh, here's a Christmas story. Once upon a time, I guess I learned how to say it right eventually. There was a little girl, and she was so happy that Christmas was coming so soon. And finally, Christmas came, and she was so happy when she found all her things on the floor. She had jewelry and likes and happy. It's funny. I guess I've always liked jewelry. The end.